Okay, so dairy, that film hopefully opens your eyes a little bit because we are sold a myth with dairy that's been incredibly effective, don't you think? I mean, credit, I guess, where credit's due. The marketing of dairy has been phenomenally successful, hasn't it, since the Second World War? Um, I think that it's partly because it's the first milk that we ever have as a human being, as a mammal, that there's something that we get very emotional about as a species when we talk about dairy as a food, and some people get incredibly defensive of it in a way that they don't have meat. And I think it's that bond. And I think what the dairy industry have done successfully, actually, is take a product that, of course, is very natural, the most natural thing in the world for a mother to produce milk for her baby. But what they have managed to do is skew what's so very natural into something rather bizarre. Because when you think about it, there are 4,500 mammals or so on planet Earth. And one of the things that ties mammals together is that we all produce milk for our babies. Every single mammal on the planet suckles that baby until the baby is weaned. No mammal then goes on, carry on giving the, you know, the baby milk as the, um, as the animal develops into adulthood. Not a single one. Because that is simply not what nature intended milk to be for. It was for the baby and the baby only. And also, crucially, it was for your baby. It wasn't for somebody else's baby, and it wasn't for the baby of another species. When you start to analyse it and strip it apart logically and try and take a step back from the emotion and just be objective about this, you realise how bizarre milk is actually as a product. More, perhaps, than anything else that we eat on the planet in many ways. Because... If you think about it, if you went into a household and somebody's cat had given birth to a kittens, and supposing your friend got down on their knees and started trying to suckle from that cat, or from a dog that had given birth to puppies, what would you think of your friend? I mean, you would sh you know, surely think that it had a screw loose. You know, you wouldn't know how to cope with such behaviour. <laughs> and you'd probably get them to see a doctor. <laughs> And yet, when you think about it, that is what we do, which is why we produce this poster, which I brought for you today. <coughs> and I, I thought you might want to pass those round. But it was cut out the middleman, because it's showing a guy in a business suit suckling directly from the cow who's given birth to her calf. That calf is taken away. And of course, we as humans, that is what we're doing. OK, it might not be that direct. We like to have the middleman, of course. But that is what we're doing in effect. We're still suckling as an adult human being from another species. And so when you start to think about it like that, just logically, coldly almost, as I say, try and step back from the emotion, it starts to make sense, actually, why dairy is so damaging um, beyond weaning. And I'll go into that more um, in a little bit. I thought what was interesting, actually, do, you re do any of you remember the um, comedy programme Little Britain um, with David Walliams, etc.? And do you remember the sketch Little Bitty? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of you do. Well, again, the shock value of that, because Little Britain was all about shocking, wasn't it? That, that, that was the humour of it. For those of you that don't know, it was all about an adult guy who's, you know, very plumb in the mouth, very poosh, and he would go out to dinner with his mama, and he would ask to suckle from her at some, you know, at the opera or whatever it would be. And of course, that she would get her breast out and suckle a grown son, and that would be the shock value of it. And everyone was like, oh, "That's very uncomfortable. Don't want to think about that." And you know, and that's of course what Little Britain was about was pushing the boundaries. But actually, when you think about it, what are we doing every time we, as a species, take milk from a cow? So it kind of, it makes me laugh that actually that sketch that everyone was so shocked about, actually what he was doing is a damn sight more natural than what we do in real life, which was take it from another species altogether. <laughs> so when you start to analyse it and tear it apart and you think, well, how long have we actually been drinking milk? That's the other thing they play on. They make it seem like the dairy industry, like we've been doing it forever. In fact, you know, as a species, we only started drinking other mammals' milk 6,000 years ago. 
And that is nothing in our evolutionary history. That means in the millions and millions of years that we have developed to get to where we are today, we have never consumed milk beyond weaning. I mean, it's literally a very fast blink of the eye in our evolutionary history. It is simply not a natural thing to do at all. So what about the cows then? Well, there's about 2 million dairy cows and 2 million calves in the UK. Almost all of those are Holsteins and Frisians. Holsteins are taking over because they're larger and they've got a higher milk production. They've been selectively bred by humans to produce yet more, yet more milk, which the film you just saw um, showed you some of the damage that that does to the animal. Because, of course, any female mammal is meant to produce milk for her own baby. You're not meant to be selectively bred. How would we feel if we were selectively bred to produce yet more, yet more, yet more milk and only milk twice a day um, and all the problems that that would bring with it because, of course, a calf suckle several, several times a day. So the amount of milk that we get out of these cows now is about double than it was in the 1970s, so that's how much the milk um, yield has gone up with selective breeding. And that causes all kinds of problems. It leads to lameness, it leads to mastitis. Many of the cows become infertile, way too young, by the way. Um, and they're killed. I mean, how would we like to be killed because we couldn't get pregnant? But this is our mindset as a species with cows. So a quarter are killed each year due to those things that I've just mentioned. And many actually are killed before their third lactation. So that's at just four to five years old. For an animal, I went to a sanctuary in Sussex, for example, where there was a mother and daughter cow that had been rescued, and they were 34 and 36 years old, the mum and daughter. Um, if you read a textbook, they wouldn't read that long. They'd probably say into their 20s. But nevertheless, four to five years old, whatever the natural lifespan is, it's really, really young to be killed. And it's about us being killed at about 15 years old, the equivalent. So dairy industry, of course, is massively supported by our government. It's massively supported by the European Union in terms of um, money that's given for campaigns. For example, £3 million was given to the Naturally Beautiful campaign, which was aimed at our teenagers, UK teenagers, trying to get them to consume milk for hair and skin. But what's the truth of all this? I'm coming on to that. First of all, let me just give you a little, a little tiny inkling into the natural life of a dairy cow. What would her life, what's it meant to be like if we weren't in control? Well, cows are part of the Bovidae family, which includes other animals like goats, sheep, uh, bison, buffalo. And today's cows descended from a much larger animal called the auroch, which was shot by humans, of course, to extinction um, in the 1600s. So herds of a natural cow, we know this because, have any of you heard of the um, white cattle at Chillingham Park in Northumberland? It's a fascinating place because these animals are practically wild, and so you can study them. You can go along to the park, but you have to be accompanied by a warden. But these animals have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and just left to it without any human intervention, which is incredible, isn't it? Because there's so few places where that is actually the case. So we know very well how these animals live, how they choose to live. And they live in herds, usually maximum number within one herd would be 30 animals. And most herds are one bull, the dominant bull, several cows, and they're young. And the young males, like as so many mammals, tend to go off in bachelor herds before they try and be the boss. Um, so these semi-wild cattle, they show us that um, they have a strict social hierarchy. And the young inherit their mother's status. The matriarchal groups, the females, very important part, obviously. The mothers and daughters groom and graze together for their whole lives. And you know, and sometimes I think, don't they do better than us in terms of their loyalty to one another? The females have got several friendships with unrelated cows, though, as well. It's not just family. And the structures tend to remain stable for many, many years. The young far calves form bonds that remain, as I said, for life um, between each other, not just with their mothers. And their mothers go away. They give birth privately. They hide the calf for about a week from the group. And then they bring her out, and the bull will ex escort her back into the group, and the other females will inspect the new arrival. The female, the mum, she suckles... Um, a female calf until she's about nine months old and then she's weaned off and a boy calf, a male calf, she'd wean him at about one year old, a bit older. So
so I'm telling you that because imagine the life then of a modern dairy cow. She's pregnant for nine months, the same as us, so it's a long pregnancy. She gives birth and her baby is always, whether female or male, always taken from her at two to three days old. She's an advanced mammal and I cannot imagine what she goes through each time that happens to her. All I know is that I've lived in the countryside for decades and I've heard the bellowing and it's a very specific cry and you know what's happened. And it goes on and on as well. Um, the mother then, of course, is milked, but she's milked for humans, not for her own species. The calf never gets to suckle um, the mother's actual milk past the two to three days. And then the mother is re-impregnated artificially, and she's still suckled, in effect, by humans seven months into that pregnancy. So for seven out of nine months of her pregnancy, she's being milked for humans. Her male calves, um, some of them will be killed for beef, of course. Some of them are killed for veal, younger. Um, the footage you just saw showed a little bit of our Cadbury investigation. Cadbury's, of course, being a huge company. So we wanted to film what was just the norm. And we went on to a lot of farms, actually, about 16. And it, uh, these poor, poor animals, they are just machines that give birth, have their babies taken away. And of course, that calf that you saw being shot in the back of a truck, he was um, killed for the hunt, for the dogs to be fed to them. And it just shows you how cheap life is. Um, and it's horrendous for a product that nobody needs, which hopefully I'll have convinced you of <laughs> by the end of this talk. The females go on to replace her, of course, in the dairy herd or are sold into other dairy herds. And the dairy cow herself, as I said, average age, about four or five years old, um, she's killed for meat, of course, as well. So the dairy industries and the meat industries are very, very intertwined. Professor John Webster, he's at Bristol University in the veterinary department, I'll just give you a quote from him, says of the cow, she's a supreme example of an overworked mother. The dairy cow is exposed to more abnormal physiological demands than any other farmed animal. And I say that because I think we tend to think of factory farmed animals as being cruelly treated, as the animals we need to save, as the animals we need to expose what's happening to them. And we forget often about the dairy cow. And there's a natural order, isn't there, of changing your diet, which tends to be cut red meat out first, then it tends to be chickens, ducks, and so forth. And then it tends to be fish. And then last of all, it's we think about dairy. Um, and that's, of course, because milk comes from a living animal. So there's a natural logic in our thinking that way. But I think we've also got a very false perception of the life of a dairy cow. We think that because some of them have part of their lives outside, that somehow it's more idyllic, when, in fact, the life of a dairy cow is anything but idyllic. And, of course, many of the farms we filmed on for Cadbury's, the animals never got to graze at all. So zero grazing is here and now, actually. So, why are they killed so young? Well, I mentioned briefly, it's loss of the body tissue due to the huge demands that we place on them. So imagine you're pregnant for nine months, seven out of those nine months you're producing milk, but you're not just producing milk, you're producing it at a rate that's not natural for any mammal. So imagine all the energy that's got to go into producing all that milk and you're being milked every day. Imagine all the energy you're making your calf grow normally. And then on top of that, well, you've got to have some of that food for you, haven't you? Some of the nutrients for you. And in fact, the end result is what you saw in that film where you get this coat rack appearance. So next time you drive along the motorway and you look at some black and white cows in a field, I challenge you to look a bit more closely because in every field you will see this coat rack appearance where you can see the ribs and you can actually see that she's malnourished. And that's because she cannot eat enough to sustain herself healthily because of the demands that we've put on her. And by contrast, when you look at a beef herd, um, you might even think they're all male, and in fact that's because the udders are so small and tucked away you don't e often even notice them because they're a different breed and their udders look the way they're supposed to on a cow. Um, and they generally look much healthier animals. It's because we d haven't um, genetically or selectively bred them to overproduce all this milk which takes its toll on the animal herself. 
Um, and you'll see the difference between them now when you know, you'll notice it. So what, when I just said she can't eat enough to actually sustain herself, that's actually got a name. It's called metabolic hunger. And we know the government accepts it exists, but they just say, basically, it's a part of dairy farming. That's the way it is. So she's got a conflict within her whether she should eat or whether she should rest because she just can't give herself enough nutrients to sustain herself healthily. So she's malnourished permanently, in other words. Lameness, half of all cows go lame each year um, for many, many reasons. Um, another thing that's um, a real problem that's connected to the lameness is laminitis, which is acute or chronic inflammation of the soft tissue, which is between the bone and the outer wall of the foot, which is incredibly painful. And you saw on the film a lot of cows were limping. And again, Professor Webster says, imagine crushing your fingernails in a door and then somebody stamping on your fingertips. And that will give you an idea of how it feels to have laminitis. Mastitis, one third of our UK dairy herd at any one time, one third of them have got mastitis, which is completely unacceptable. But it is accepted again by the government. They all know that this is the case. So that's about one million cases per year. So this is not trivial. So why so much mastitis, um, which women here may have suffered from mastitis, you know what I'm talking about. Well, the bugs that cause mastitis, there's lots and lots of different kinds of them. They thrive in dirty, wet bedding and poorly ventilated buildings. And as I said, increasingly, cows are in those buildings all their lives, not just six months of the year. So it's very easy for these bugs to, to um, spread. And also, if the equipment that's uh, milking the cows isn't cleaned properly, then, of course, it's going to spread from animal to animal to animal. And that brings me on to pus, actually because you get an abnormal breakdown in mastitis of the actual tissue within the udders. And what happens when you've got a breakdown of tissue? You get your white blood cells coming, don't you? Whoom, at least they should do, to try and chomp up the bugs causing that infection. And any of you that fell over, especially as a kid, and you'll remember all that oozy, greeny, creamy stuff, which of course is you know, your white blood cells doing their job to eat the infection. Well, that's what happens in the case of milk because there are so many white blood cells going to the site to eat up the bugs. And so all UK milk basically, in effect, um, is infected with pus, whether it's organic milk or non-organic milk. And the actual legal limits, they had to put legal limits on it because otherwise <laughs> we're drinking a pint of pus, basically. Um, 400 million pus cells per litre sold is the legal limit in the European Union, it's high, higher in the United States. So basically, if you're consuming milk, you are consuming pus. So what about our health? How does all this impact on our, on our health? Well, as I said, we evolved not to consume milk at all. and We've only been doing it for the past 6,000 years, which is very, very recent, as I said, in our evolutionary history. So most human beings on this planet lose the ability to digest the sugar in milk, which you'll all know is called lactose. We all lose that ability, most of us, about three quarters of the human population loses it actually. So those three quarters that lose the ability to digest the sugar in milk lose the ability after weaning around that time. And that sugar, lactose, is broken down by an enzyme called lactase, which we lose, most of us, three quarters of us, as I said. And that lactase breaks it down into glucose and galactose. So if you're not breaking down lactose, what happens is it ferments in effect in your large intestine and it builds up gas. People feel sick. They can get cramps, bloating, diarrhea, wind, usually within about two hours of um, eating the lactose. And the symptoms are very similar to irritable bowel syndrome. So most people can't tolerate milk. It doesn't kill you, this. It's just uncomfortable. But 90% um, of Thais have no lactase, 85% of Japanese, 85% of Taiwanese, 70% of American blacks, and so, and so you're getting the picture. So we're talking about most of the world's peoples, actually. And that's, I'm just saying that, really, to assure you that we haven't actually evolved to consume it at all after weaning. It's an assurance, really, a reassurance. So cows only produce milk, of course, because they're made pregnant and they give birth, just to make that absolutely clear, because I had a BBC cameraman say to me, but Juliet, they, get, they produce milk because they eat grass. They just make it into milk. And then you've missed out a crucial step. They have to have a baby first. Oh, never thought of that. 
That's because we're not encouraged to think about these things. So cow's milk, who's it meant for? Obviously for the growing calf, of course it is. Now calves are not like human babies, are they? There are substantial differences, you may have noticed, between a calf and a human being. And basically the milk is geared to a very fast growing skeleton in a calf. For us, it's it geared into the nervous system, into growing the brain really fast. So there's two different emphases between the two species. We're very slow growing, aren't we? We don't, we're not fully grown until we're, what, 20 years old? So with um, a calf, you're looking at tripling their weight uh, within a year to a heavy animal, 300 to 400 kilograms, something like that, whereas a human woman of about 5 foot 4, her average weight is about 10 stone, 3.5 pounds these days, so, which is, what, 65 kilos. And you're talking about a long time to get to that weight. So the job of the milk and the, the, way it's con you know, the way it's made up, its constituents, are obviously different for two very different species. So calcium is four times higher in cow's milk than human milk, and yet we absorb the calcium from human milk much, much, much better as a human being. And we absorb it really well from plants after weaning, because that's what we've evolved to do. Human milk's higher in carbohydrates, and it's lower in protein. It's got a similar amount of fat, but a different types of fat in different... Um, constituents. So a cow's milk is higher in saturated fats and our milk is higher in the mono and polyunsaturated fats. Um, so cows basically, are the, as I said, they're the bodybuilders and we're the brain builders, putting it crudely. Cow's milk also, and this is crucial, I'll come on to this, has much more casein than human milk, which is a protein which we find quite hard to digest and it's used as a basis for glue, actually. So milk is high in saturated fat, cholesterol, animal protein, growth factors and hormones. These things we don't want to be eating as an adult at all. So 75 to 90% of milk is from pregnant cows. So she's milked seven months into her pregnancy, then she's milked again when she gives birth and seven months again into her next pregnancy. So two-thirds of UK milk is from pregnant cows. Remember that, two-thirds of milk, so whether it's making cheese, ice cream, whatever you can think of, two-thirds of the products are coming from pregnant cows. But why does this matter in terms of our health? Well, milk contains, let me quote this to you, many biologically active molecules. In a typical glass of milk, there are 35 hormones and 11 growth factors, including... IGF-1, or insulin-like growth factor 1. IGF-1 is the major predictor now of whether we will develop cancer. You don't want high levels of IGF-1. We are not meant to consume it at all. So, oestrogen, progesterone, obviously a part of that cocktail, um, because they're meant for a growing calf, just as they're meant for a human baby. But you're not meant to be consuming oestrogen from your diet when you grow up. So these molecules that have evolved to direct the rapid growth of a calf into a cow, and again I'll quote, may initiate inappropriate signaling pathways, is how it's um, put in humans, that can lead to diseases such as cancer. Insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1, high in milked pregnant cows, is identical to the IGF-1 that we produce. There's nothing in them. They're the same. So our bodies recognise cow's IGF-1, and they respond to it, and it can land on our receptors and initiate inappropriate growth of cells, basically. So, IGF-1 from cow's milk is linked to an increased risk of childhood cancers, breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, and cancers of the pancreas and prostate, and gastrointestinal cancers. Now you're starting to get the feel for why I say not only is dairy not needed in the diet, it's actively dangerous and potentially lethal in the human diet. So IGF-1, which I keep banging on about because it's so important and so few people have heard of it, um, but is becoming increasingly recognised in the scientific world as a marker as whether you will um, get cancer. So IGF-1 is a growth factor that promotes cell growth and division, and it's crucial actually for growth and development, but it must be at the right levels. So high IGF-1 can cause cells to grow out of control. And the main place we get IGF-1 in the diet, as I said, and I'll say it again though, is dairy. So what about cancer? Well, there are three stages to cancer, initiation, promotion, and progression. 
And I take this analogy from Colin Campbell, who wrote a fabulous book called The China Study, which I really highly recommend. And he relates cancer like to like grow, growing a lawn, planting a lord, lawn. So initiation is when you plant the seeds. Promotion is when they start to grow. And invasion or progression is when they grow everywhere you don't want to. So that lawn has got completely out of control and it's hard to actually get back to where you want it to get, if at all. So the question, of course, in initiation, when you actually plant the seeds, what causes the planting of those seeds in the first place? Well, you'll have all heard of carcinogens or cancer-causing agents. They do that. And, of course, you'll all know carcinogens. The most well-known, of course, is tobacco smoke, which is incredibly um, carcinogenic. Um, but there are lots of carcinogens. We can't get away from that. Even in the purest lifestyle, we live on an earth that we've created with thousands and thousands of toxic chemicals. Um, you know, that is the life that we do lead. The carcinogens themselves um, don't usually cause the mutation. There have to be certain chemical process within the cell that then makes the DNA mutate. And nature's incredibly smart. There's lots of things that happen to stop that mutation from happening. And diet is very important when it comes down to that, to stopping it from happening. Um, but if the mutation goes ahead and then that cell replicates, so the daughter cell has the mutation, then that's permanent, it's irreversible. So you've, in fact, got a cancer cell sat there. It doesn't mean, though, and this is the really crucial bit that Colin Campbell's very interested in, it doesn't mean that you will go on to get the cancer. Uh, because the next stage is reversible, and this is the promotion stage. And like a seed, think about it. You could plant a seed, but it doesn't necessarily grow, does it? It can sit there in the soil waiting for the right conditions, and it's the same with cancer cells. So that seed needs rain, it needs um, warmth, it needs nutrients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, it's the same for a cancer cell. It also needs the right conditions to grow. And so there are certain foods, and this is the crucial bit really, that are promoters of cancer, and there are certain food, foods that are called anti-promoters. So guess what the anti-promoters are? Guess what helps you not form the cancer? Very good. <laughs> Don't be frightened. <laughs> so we're looking at the plant kingdom. This won't surprise you, but we're looking at a good whole food vegan diet that's not a junk food diet, a good whole food vegan diet. So the foods that protect us are fresh fruits and vegetables. They're the nuts and seeds groups. They're the pulses group, the beans, peas, and lentils, and also the whole grains group. And that is a whole food vegan diet, isn't it? The chart I've given out to you. Um, all these foods are protectors. And I do a list, if any of you want me to email it to you, of um, the most protective foods. So they're the protectors. But crucially, what are the um, actual promoters that feed cancer growth? Well, Colin Campbell, he states... Um, and he's an incredible guy who studied cancer most of his um, life, a scientist, a nutritional biochemist. And he states that the, one of the most damaging protein that we can consume as a human is casein. And that is one of the main proteins in mi milk, in dairy. And he says it enables, it facilitates cancers of many different types to be able to grow in a human being. And so that is why the title of my talk is Why You Don't Need Dairy. <laughs> it's a push-pull process, this anti-promoters and, and promoters. So cancer, one in four in the UK die from cancer, but one in three of us actually get it. So incredibly common in the UK now. And those that are linked directly to diet, if you like, are bowel cancer, stomach cancer, mouth, larynx, esophagus, prostate and breast. And many others are helped along, if you like, by a poor diet. And breast cancer, briefly, one in eight women in the UK now get breast cancer. And it's about one in 10,000 in rural China, but it's not due to genes. We absolutely know it's not due to genes. So there are environmental factors or lifestyle factors that increase cancer massively in Western lifestyles. And one of them is definitely diet. So, for example, Cambridge University found that those with the highest saturated fat intakes doubled the incidence of breast cancer. And people consuming lots of oestrogen, and 60 to 80% of our oestrogens come from um, dairy again, the rest from meat, poultry, and eggs. Um, again, uh, women with breast cancer tend to have more oestrogens in their body. 
So uh, same with prostate cancer, by the way. Um, it's largely a hormone-dependent cancer. So men consuming estrogens, it's a, a negative thing. And also men consuming high saturated fats, especially red meat and dairy, again, can be a trigger for um, prostate cancer in men. Um, and IGF-1 itself, we know that IGF-1 can make breast cells grow, cancer cells grow out of control. And IGF-1, as I mentioned earlier, again, mainly comes from um, consuming the milk of pregnant animals, two-thirds of our dairy products. So there are many cancers that are linked to what we eat. I'll just mention bowel cancer because on meat, they've actually basically, in effect, seen now. It's not just the fact... We've always known that fibre protects you from cal um, cancer of the bowel. That makes sense because fibre is like a brush sweeping out the poisons. So when you consume meat and the toxins are created in your large intestines, the fibre brushes out the poisons, which is fabulous. But we also know now that meat itself causes the mutations. So they've actually seen that when we consume red meat, there are higher genetic mutations in, in your intestines, and it's done, the damage is done by what are called n nitroso compounds, and they form when we're digesting red meat. So it's not just that a vegan diet protects you, it's that red meat actually directly does the damage as well. So there's two different prongs there. Prostate cancer, I'll just mention a study in California as one example. 93 men with early prostate cancer were given a vegan diet, a whole food diet with no drugs. And the cancer regressed in the vegan group, but it did not regress in the control group. And the protective foods that came out of this study and others as well subsequently, by the way, the pulses group, really important. So it's all the peas, beans and lentils, any that you enjoy, tomatoes, uh, very protective, raisins, dates and dried fruits and fresh fruits and also very noticeable, as with cancer of the bowel, that exercise decreases your risk of prostate cancer. Okay. Um, I think the figures are like that some in the UK, somebody's dying from a heart attack or stroke every two minutes. I mean, it's quite incredible. And heart disease is so related to lifestyle. Yes, there is a genetic component for a very small proportion of people, but for most of us, it is what we do to ourselves. And I think sometimes heart disease is made more complicated than it really is. So I'm just going to paint a picture for you because I'm going to simplify it to, because it's not that difficult to understand uh, about why diet and dairy um, has been involved in this massive increase in people dying from heart disease. So imagine um, a hose pipe. We all did this. As I still do this now. <laughs> And you turn on the hose pipe and it's free-flowing, the water's free-flowing. So imagine that that hose pipe is the main artery supplying your heart, the coronary artery. And you put your thumb a tiny bit across the end. You must have all done this. What happens in that hose pipe? You can feel, can't you, the pressure building up in the hose pipe, can't you? So imagine that you put your thumb halfway across now. Now feel the difference, or imagine the difference, of the water trying to get through or the blood trying to supply your heart. Now your heart is about the size of your fist and that over it. And it's beating, what, 100,000 times a day? Something like that. I mean, it's a, the point is it's a phenomenally hard-working muscle. So it itself needs lots of oxygen. And obviously it needs more oxygen if you're running around, if you're having an argument, so you've got hot emotions, all having sex, all these things, you need more oxygen to the heart. What happens if the plaque's forming across that artery then? So you can imagine the pressure that's building up. What happens if the plaque, maybe it breaks off completely because of the rush of the blood, or it just goes right across the artery, either lodges somewhere else, or the plaque just becomes so big that the flow just becomes less and less and less. Well, obviously, part of the muscle of your heart dies because it's not getting the oxygen that it needs, and that, of course, is a heart attack. So how does this relate to our diet? And that's the crucial thing, isn't it? What's actually forming? What is forming that blockage? What is that thumb going across the hose pipe? And in fact, what it is often is the fact that we do damage the arteries by things like smoking, maybe drinking alcohol, our lifestyle. So the, li the, the um, lining of the actual um, blood vessel is damaged itself. Then you do something like consume saturated fats. Now, consuming cholesterol from animal products, because cholesterol is only in animal products. It's not in any plant foods, including fatty foods like nuts or avocados. They don't contain any cholesterol. Plants don't make it. So you only eat cholesterol from animal foods. So you get it in dairy, you get it in meats and so forth, and fish. 
So you can eat cholesterol, but that actually isn't what does the real damage. What creates most of the bad cholesterol is making it yourself from your liver. And what triggers you to make it is saturated fats and hydrogenated fats. Now, where do we get saturated fats from our, in our diet? First and foremost, dairy and meat. So we're coming back to dairy again. Where in dairy? Hard cheeses, butter, 80% butter, 80% of the fats in butter are, sad, are saturated bad fats. Hard cheeses, think about how fatty they are. They trigger you to produce bad cholesterol. That then um, goes to the area of damage in the blood vessel, which may be the one that feeds your heart. It may be feeding your leg. It may be feeding somewhere else. It could be anywhere. Um, and then white blood cells are attracted to the area. And they start to engorge on this bad cholesterol and they send out messages to other white blood cells to come to the area, help me eat this bad cholesterol up. So you get these white blood cells full of fat forming this plaque. And even worse, when you consume this bad fat, this saturated fats, they tell your blood vessels to stop producing nitric oxide. Now you're thinking, what on earth are you talking about? What the heck's nitric oxide? Why does that matter? It matters because nitric oxide is like Teflon to your blood vessels, allowing the blood to flow freely. And instead, the fat makes your blood vessels become sticky. It makes the white blood cells become sticky. And it makes the clotting agents, the platelets, become sticky. And that's what you don't want. So the plaque builds up and builds up. And the more saturated bad fats you eat, the more dairy you're eating, hard cheeses, ice cream, chocolate, and so forth the more this process is happening to you. Red meat, of course, poultry, chicken has got a pint of fat in it, for goodness sake, each chicken. So all these things are doing damage, and that leads you towards having heart disease or having a stroke, or like one guy that I met who couldn't walk because it was the artery in his leg that had been blocked up. So, you know, this is not rocket science. Diet does cause heart disease. It certainly does cause strokes and being... A whole food vegan diet is so protective because it actually encourages the nitric acid to be produced and it heals the actual damage and it even, even the antioxidants from plants, especially vitamins, beta carotene, C and E, actually dissolve the plaques. So not only do they protect you, they can actually undo the damage. So incredibly important. The final thing I want to mention is osteoporosis now. And the reason I'm mentioning this, obviously, is because the dairy industry uses <laughs> the fact that it contains calcium as if nothing else in the world contained calcium. And I wonder, you know, I said three quarters of the world are lactose intolerant. Well, why aren't these three quarters of the world like jelly blobs on the floor if we so need calcium from milk to form our bones? And of course, we do not. In fact, ironically, the opposite is true. And that's just starting to get through. And we're launching a campaign soon called Break Free, which shows this. So just briefly to explain, the pH of your blood has to be 7.35 to 7.45. So it's slightly alkaline. Seven is neutral. Less than seven is acidic. Diet is the main factor influencing the pH of your blood. So everything we eat and drink is either alkaline forming or acid forming when we digest it. Okay? When you um, keep eating things that, are too, that create too much acid, um, that triggers your bones to break down because you cannot have over acidic blood because you will die. And so what happens is you break down your bone and the calcium is released and that buffers the effect of eating something that makes acid. So the crucial question is, what has this got to do with dairy? Well, yes, dairy does contain calcium, but it also contains a lot of animal protein. This animal protein contains sulfur. It's high in sulfur. That sulfur forms sulfuric acid and that has to be neutralized. So we do that by releasing calcium from our bones. And that is why, which is very well um, studied worldwide, by the way, all the nations worldwide that consume the most dairy have the most osteoporosis. They have the weakest bones, not the strongest. Those nations that consume a largely plant-based diet have the strongest bones, not the weakest. This is really important because this is what they sell their product on. And it is a lie. So where do you get calcium from and where we meant to and not meant to consume milk at all? It's in seeds, especially sesame seeds, exceptionally high, but all seeds, all nuts, especially almonds and brazils. 
It's in the dark green leafy vegetable group, so think broccoli, watercress, all of it, all of it. Think of swedes, think of fortified soy milk, has as much so uh, calcium as um, cow's milk, but none of the damage because it hasn't got the high sulfur amino acids. Cinnamon's got it, sprinkle it on your breakfast, fennel, olives, it's all over the place. We're meant to get calcium from plant foods and we absorb it exceptionally well from plant foods. So after all that, I hope you think, why on earth have we been sold such a lie about needing dairy? You know, it's a cancer promoter, it contains casein. The saturated fats promote heart disease, strokes, cancers, obesity, and breast cancer, and so forth. Cholesterol is linked to heart disease and strokes. The IGF-1 is linked to many cancers, including breast and prostate. Estrogen is linked to cancers, including breast cancer again. The cow's milk is linked to diabetes type 1. Lactose intolerance in three quarters of the world's people, farting, belching, cramps. Casein allergy causes eczema, asthma, ear infections, intestinal bleeding. And the protein from milk finally leaches out calcium, paradoxically causing osteoporosis. So I'm asking you to turn everything we've been told completely on its head and accept that we really do not need dairy. In fact, it's dangerous. And veganism actually is one of the few individual acts we can all perform that has an immediate impact. It's the biggest step we can take to end the daily cruelties handed out to farmed animals. It's the first step to healing the planet. And it's a political act and a clear expression, expression of a belief in a different way of doing things, a different kind of world, a better world. And Viva's forged ahead in ensuring that the awareness of these issues is getting better and greater than ever. And there are more vegetarians and vegans, of course, in the UK than ever before. And thanks to people like yourselves who've supported us, you're enabling us to save animals, save yourselves and save the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>